Welcome to the Personal Brand Era podcast. I'm your host, Ella Ray, and I'm excited to talk to Lauren Orr today. She's a business strategist and a coach. By the way, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, you absolutely did, Lauren Orr. And thank you so much, Ella, for having me. Uh, Lauren is a coach that um, helps people one-on-one -on -one and also has a small group program that takes a holistic approach to starting and growing an online coaching and consulting business. And first of all, of course, I want to know, how did you get into coaching? Oh, that's quite a long story. But to cut it short, basically, I have a very diverse background in business, in economic development planning. Um, so traditionally educated with an MBA, but I also have an education background, so a professorship in international business management. And when you combine those things and the work that I've been doing with corporates in the universities, there was still something missing for me. So I kind of really thought I had my perfect career, to be honest with you. I really wanted the professorship. I wanted the corporate consulting. Um, but there was a lack of kind of individual connection in all of the projects that I were doing, was doing. I'm a business strategist. Um, and so I decided to take my teaching skills and upskill that into coaching because what I realized in the university um, environment as well, I was coaching my students more than teaching them because unfortunately in, in many instances, the formal education system is quite rigid and quite structured and is lagging behind in terms of how students are you know, empowered with the knowledge that they're given to actually go out into a very complex, very dynamic, kind of scary world and actually work with that information. And so that was a gap that I identified for myself. Um, and I decided I'd like to help individuals build their businesses because I did it for a couple of people, kind of helping them move from corporate um, into the online space, into the world, you know, just with, with friends, with people in my network. And it, it kind of the bug bit. It was so much fun. And I realized that it's an absolute privilege to be able to dig deep into someone's life and to really help them find their purpose, to understand their core expertise and to really turn that into something that they can use to make an impact, but also, of course, to earn them the money that they need to earn to live the kind of lifestyle that they want to have. So that's pretty much um, my journey in, in the short version into coaching. And I'm pretty sure whenever you're working with someone, you are meeting a lot of misconceptions when it comes to starting an online business. Like I remember my own misconceptions <laughs> and also meeting uh, of other people, other um sometimes negative beliefs and sometimes pure misconceptions itself let's talk about them what do you see on a daily basis that people need to kind of refrain and um, have a realistic view on what it actually means to build an online business i think this is the perfect place to start ella because honestly this is where things make or break it for someone who's entering into an entrepreneurial space the first and foremost thing is that entrepreneurial journeys are tough so the yeah. biggest misconception I see is that simply because we're having a business that's online versus a business that's offline, people think it's suddenly easy for whatever reason, which in actual fact makes absolutely no sense. Yes, the online space allows us a lot of opportunities, a lot of freedoms that we can have. We can work from home, we can work mobile. It does allow us and enable location and time freedom more than a brick and mortar business or you know something like that that's more offline. Um, if it's in that construct, but at the end of the day, that doesn't make the fact that you need real business skills and real business acumen to build an online business. So I think that is misconception number one. So it is still starting a business despite many advantages online. You need a strategy, you need an implementation plan and you need a budget. You actually do need to invest money, even if it's your time. So this is what people underestimate a huge amount. I see clients coming to me and saying, well, I started kind of with nothing. I was financing it with my nine to five and I can't pay the software and I can't do this because the fact of the matter is whether you are investing your time, which means you're cutting that from your nine to five job or wherever else, whatever other income source you have, it costs to start a business. So I think that for me, that's misconception number one. It is still a business online, offline. You need to learn business. That's where you need to upskill yourself if you don't have that background. Also, like any business, you know, there are highs and lows. So it is simple in terms of the concept to start an online business. But simple and easy are not the same thing. So it doesn't make it automatically easy to ensure, you know, that you're going to have a business that's going to be sustainable, that's going to work for you. So you need to be doing your research. You need to understand what it is you're getting into. 
And that is obviously dependent on your skills, on the niche, on the kind of people that you want to help, the kind of problem that you're going to solve. And of course, I would say, you know, you have to get support where you can. So from a community, from um, a coach or a mentor, if you can afford to do so. So that's really number two. Um, it is simple, but it is not easy. And so there are going to be our highs and lows. This is an entrepreneurial journey. And the third thing I think, I mean, there are so many, but I think the third one I would say is really important as well, is that your credentials do matter. And this was one of the kind of misconceptions I had back and forth, actually, when I started my own coaching business, because, you know, I'm highly qualified in my space. I have a PhD in sociology. I have an MBA and I came into the online world and it seemed like nobody cared. They're like, oh, they don't care if you've got a PhD. Anyone can be a coach. And I believed that for a while, to be very honest. So I never used those credentials. And then clients started hiring me. And when, you know, you always have to go into a feedback cycle with your clients, they all told me, no, we hired you because of your background in education. We hired you because of your credentials. And then I realized, I'm like, okay, people in this market are still very much looking at credentials. So we have seen this massive increase in coaches and consultants online in recent years, particularly, you know, through and after the COVID pandemic. And although it's a massive industry and there's opportunity for everyone and it's going to grow, it's worth billions of dollars, consumers are becoming more and more wary because they unfortunately in this space have been a lot of coaches, consultants who are offering very stock standard stuff and at a mass scale, they're not really getting into helping individual people. And so for me as an educator, I respect fully the, the title of coach, the title of consultant, because we go into people's lives, we go into people's businesses um, and we have an impact and we have to take responsibility for that. So, um, we, you know, they want to, consumers want to see proof of your skills and your capabilities to help them. But I also think that it's the onus is also on us to take responsibility for that and understand that our credentials do matter. And so if you don't have them yet, that's okay. Go get them. Skill, you know, get, get your skills, um, increase your capabilities. I'm always learning. It doesn't matter what kind of title I have, whether it's an academic degree or what. I'm always learning. I'm always going back. I'm always improving my skills. I'm doing courses here and there. I'm learning from colleagues, from other experts in the arena. So those are the three really, right? It is starting a business. It's going to be difficult. It's like any other business. It's simple, yes, but it doesn't make it easy. So ensure that you do your research and your credentials matter, just to sum it up quickly for you. And I think there are multiple levels when we think about credentials or credibility by itself. Uh, you can build credibility and what is another word for it is also trust. You can build trust with prospects or uh, even clients, right? Because once they become clients, you still need to maintain that level of trust, right? Because you can Absolutely. also easily lose your, the trust. So I think there are multiple levels when it comes to uh, credentials. And I think this is also one of the reasons why many, many women that I meet at least um, in, in my services have, are afraid of being a coach, of being a coach fully, right, with the confidence that they ultimately need to lead someone from a pain point to a solution, if you will, right? So yeah, get, getting away from this mindset of I can only be a coach when I have credentials I think we don't need to do that, even though I fully agree with you. If you have the credentials already, use them. Like, this is gold right. for people. They will already trust you. But as you said, if you don't have the credentials, you can build trust on multiple levels, right? You can build trust by the level of empathy that you have, for example, right? And this right. is like the initial spark that you can start with. You don't necessarily have to uh, wait until you have that credential or until you have the certificate finished in six months start now with what you have right if you are already a very confident empathetic person that's what you where you can build trust with prospects already right there are other levels that where you can build trust uh, it does not have to be a professional credentially like uh, thing that you need to have but you need to lean towards credibility and having credentials because ultimately that's the longevity game that you want to play as a coach right correct, correct. and i think Absolutely. one of the things that people also um, kind of it is a mistake in their mindset is thinking that quantity is better than quality because we see that a lot uh, some coaches are kind of promoting that just start just 
put things out, just bombard everyone with what you have and you can adjust later on. And I would love to know from you who has such a, a huge amount of uh, credentials behind her back or on her shoulders, what do you think about the controversy between quality and quantity when it comes to positioning yourself in the market and being unique, standing out, which is your particular uh, take on building businesses. I think you, uh, this is the focus that you have. You, you want to help people to really stand out and not just blend into the, the red ocean. Exactly, absolutely. I, I love that you brought up this point because when I say credentials and that misconception was a two-way street really where people who have the credentials are not using them, people who don't have the credentials are not you know, skilling up and, and getting, getting those credentials because they think, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. So I think there is a huge amount to unpack there and you're right, this relates very, very distinctly to the quantity versus um, quality debate that we have in the coaching arena. You know, Do we fill programs with hundreds of people who don't get individual support and this and that? These are fundamentally individual decisions but what i like to ensure is that people you know think about the business model and their purpose and their intention when they're starting their coaching business because the way in which we define coaching mentorship you know people have their different definitions we have our textbook definitions and then we have you know how do you see yourself as a coach and i work very much as you said on the individual level so as a coach myself in my business I'm a diehard fan of quality over quantity. So that doesn't mean you can't make money on quantity and a lot of people do. And I'm not judging that, but it's just personally and the values and beliefs that I have as an educator as well, which is a you know fundamental platform on which I have built my business. I believe that coaches and consultants carry that responsibility for innovation, for shaping the future of the individuals and of the organizations, the companies, that they're working for and therefore should always focus on quality first because that is the foundation you said longevity of a sustainable success of a sustainable business as opposed to quick trend driven profits right and i want to come back to summarizing that credentials issue if i may very very briefly because i use three e's to describe what makes me a great coach and i talk to my clients about these three e's all the time um, and for me, this gives you credibility and builds up, you know, the, the credentials that you have. The first is education. Now, I don't only mean formal education. I mean, where have you gained your skills? What have you done? Where are your sources of learning? Then the second E is your experience. So your experience can be your life experience, your formal experience in industry, your travel experience, you know, your maturity, all of the things that have shaped the way that you value things, that your, your, your beliefs, and obviously that shaped your perspective as well. The third one, and I love the, that you brought up this word, is empathy. Because when I look at competitive advantage for my clients, the way that they show up uniquely, it's not just about their education or their experience. It's not one thing. It's a combination. And the empathy that someone has to connect with people, in my opinion, that brings a fundamental element of quality into your coaching or consulting business and so we do work on that element a lot with you know people coming out of corporate very often they've been in very rigid systems you may do it this way you may not do it this way so they struggle to really embrace doing things in their own way expressing themselves and creating that human connection because in so many cultures you know i was born in south africa my husband is turkish i live in germany in all of these cultures the one thing in common is the global corporate culture of business is here and personal is here and for me, this is one of the most amazing things um, about the coaching and consulting industry is that when we break those barriers and we get into that empathetic personal connection realm, which everyone is craving, that's honestly where magic starts to happen for me. I really love how you put it, that really empathy is one of the highest qualities and distinctions between someone who blends in and someone who really stands out because it takes Absolutely. it takes work and you you normally are not born with empathy and if you are lucky so to speak and your parents taught you how to be empathetic then you already have that advantage within you right but if you don't um i also would say and would encourage uh, listeners to not be uh, discouraged by this but really take on this road and this uh, developmental stage within you it's the same with mindset right and there's uh, exactly. there's another word for 
like mindset is one thing, right? The beliefs, the thoughts that you have and uh, the, the empathy, the, the emotional part of our beings is the heart set. And I talk a lot about heart set because just like I you, I'm, I'm very, very uh, passionate about this part because I think this is a major distinguishing um, brand asset even, I would say. Uh, that Absolutely. someone, a personal brand, could really use to to stand out in in this huge market, just like you said, that is usually emotionless, sometimes very pressured into delivering results and stuff like that. Very exactly. masculine, if you will. <laughs> Even though heart set should yeah. not be attributed uh, solely to women, I I would urge uh, to not go there. But both, of course, need that type of empathy and how they manage their emotions because i feel if you don't know how to manage your emotions as a business owner as a coach like this is leadership this is where leadership Correct. starts i feel if you cannot lead yourself your own emotions your own thoughts and beliefs how do you intend to lead someone else so i think this is the foundation that someone needs to start with like first you need to have the ability to lead yourself right in in your Absolutely. wholeness as you are as a human being and then you will have all the skills that you need even though you don't have the credentials maybe if you master this piece like you can lead anyone because as a coach once again you are slightly different from a consultant right as a coach you just have to lead you don't have to need to know all the answers right you you just need to know how to lead someone where they want to go you don't need to have achieved the same result that your client wants to have you just need to know how to get there right this is at least my belief even though i strive to have the result first before i take on someone and get them there yeah but what is uh since we are talking about um the advantage standing out and not blending into in, into the masses but really finding that unique spark and the genius about yourself what would you say is a how would you define individual competitive advantage and um how does it really help someone stand out that's a great question and it's also something that i talk about because i've developed my holistic coaching approach for for coaches um, and consultants around this concept of individual competitive advantage now many people have probably heard competitive advantage it's used in organizations all the time um, we talk about usps unique selling propositions differentiation these kinds of things what I've realized, though, working with people over the last two years, individuals, is that we always look at our business while USP. So we're looking at how we, what vehicle we're using to help people to get a result. We are looking at, okay, am I qualified in, you know, in particular fields? So maybe someone would say, my USP is I have an MBA and sociology. That's a great combination for business. Is that a USP? Maybe a little bit, but it's not the competitive advantage. And so I argue that individuals need to uncover their competitive advantage, just like any business does in order to stand out, right? Because your competitive advantage is, is fundamentally what sets you apart from other coaches and consultants in your niche. It's your unique value that you bring to the table and that nobody else can replicate. So basically at the core, it's the unique set of those attributes that allows you to communicate your unique expertise, your unique experience, your empathy, right? Your approach to engaging with people, to communicating, to relationship building, and very, very important. So many people forget this, but your perspective your perspective is not just about the expertise that you have, but how do you apply that expertise in a different way, right? This is what's going to set you apart from other people within your market and within your niche. And it's basically the reason why someone would choose to work with you. Now, every now and then, I know people get their feathers ruffled a little bit when they hear the word competition. And I know that there is a, a huge push in the online space, particularly, oh, I'm a collaborator, I'm not in competition. I don't mean competition in a negative way. Competition is not negative. But the fact of the market is, uh, if you are in a market with no competition, you don't have a profitable business. Then we're in a not-for-profit charitable um, market situation. So the moment there's a market, the moment there's an exchange of money, the moment we're looking to earn and generate revenue and drive profit, we're in competition. So whether you like that word or not, that is the reality of it. And so that's why um, a couple of people suggested when I started out to change individual competitive advantage, I said, no, I'm not going to do that because that is the reality of where we are right now. It's the reason someone would choose to work with me. And actually, I take the focus off others 
It's why are they going to work with me? Why is the person that I want to work with going to work with me? It's about my relationship with my ideal clients, the kind of people that I can get the best results for in the best possible way. So especially in this online space, all of our potential clients have access to a massive, massive wealth of information and resources at their fingertips. So that means they can easily compare you. It's the same in any industry now. You know, we can go on and compare thousands of hotels, thousands of flight um, prices for, for flights to wherever we want to go in the world. And, and hey, it's the same for service providers right now. And they can make informed decisions based on their unique needs and their unique preferences. And so you need to understand and uncover your competitive advantage and leverage that because that's what's going to help you to connect with and speak to those people who are looking for exactly what it is that you've got. And that means you do stand out of the crowd and that means um, you do attract the right clients into your business. I think it is very interesting what you just said about competition. I fully agree with that. We are in competition with, we should be in competition even. If you, if you just say, if you don't have a competitor, you don't have a profitable business. And that is very true. Unless you exactly. want to create your own market, you can do that, but it will take a lot of years to do that, Correct. to get the visibility, to get the eyeballs on your idea. You, you can absolutely create your, your own ocean, your own island, if you will, but absolutely, it, it, it does not mean that it is really smart to do that. So if we acknowledge that there is competition, and I hear that a lot, this phrase, don't compare yourself, stop comparing yourself, especially among females. I hear that phrase a lot. Okay. And I think what this phrase does is actually hinder people, especially women, from actually go ahead and rationally sit down and compare herself to someone else without getting emotional. Again, we go back to the, the emotional management, the emotional um, intelligence, if you will. If you are not able to sit down and look at your compar competitors without getting jealous, without, without getting envious or however you want to feel or, or call it, you will have such problems growing as a coach because of your competition. And just imagine if your competitor has the emotional capabilities of uh, comparing herself without drowning in maybe the feeling that this competitor is so much better than she is, so much higher when it comes to followers, the money that she earns, she has a bigger house, she has this and that. If you imagine that, this competitor is able to, I don't want to say emotionless, you should never be emotionless because that's, that's again, an unhealthy way of dealing with things. But yeah. if this competitor has a higher IQ, EQ than you have, then this competitor will just dominate the market. And if you want to dominate the market, not to push everyone out, but to be a beacon of hope, if you know exactly what you can do and how much you can help other people, then you should strive to, to stand out, to be the one and only choice for your clients if you know how good you are, right? And that alone is, is such a difficulty, especially for beginner coaches to realize and to, without being arrogant about it, but really seeing who you really are and what you bring to the table. But really having the ability to, uh, to compare yourself without getting overly emotional, without having negative feelings about it. But you need to be very um, calm about your competitors. You need to know everything about your competitors, not only your dream clients, right? Your avatar, so to speak. Right. We, we hear a lot of talk about know your avatar, know who you're talking to, right? <laughs> but that's just, I feel that's just 50% of, of the whole of equation. Course if you want to build a profitable business, right? Long term, without burning out. Like knowing your competitor without drowning is crucially important. Absolutely. I, I mean, I agree because at the end of the day, you need to know in order to position your business and yourself, you need to know your client. Of course you do. But your client is also comparing you to all the other coaches and consultants out there. So that's the, the fundamental reality again. So we're back to how we would love to think about bunny rabbits and rainbows in, in a happy world where everyone is perfectly happy and everyone is great and has their own. No, looking at your competition means that you have the capability um, to honestly self-reflect on where you are, on what you can do, 
on the skills that you have, on your strengths, on your weaknesses, and make sure that those are aligned in your business. And when you want to grow and when you want to improve, which are all positive things, you know where you need to do the work. And so for me, that's what that is about. So competitor analysis, understanding the market, your ideal client is an ongoing process. When it comes to market research, that's something we're doing all the time. You know, social listening, understanding how people are talking. What are they talking about? What are their problems? How are other coaches? I follow coaches funnels all the time to see what they're doing. Not because I'm against them or need something out of it. I'm going to copy them. Not at all. I'm interested. I'm curious. A great entrepreneur, a good business owner, a good CEO knows all the time what's going on around them because that's how you develop your adaptive capacity so you can pivot, so you can provide offers, not when someone asks you for it, but you, you predict it and you see it coming and you can use the opportunities that change and that developments in the market are going to bring to us, right? And all of that requires understanding your, your competition, understanding who you are and where you fit, not just to fill the gap, but actually, in fact, to elevate yourself out of that as well and to understand, you know, what do I bring that's really unique? What do I offer that other people are not offering? What are they offering in a way and perhaps that I actually don't even agree with? So their mistakes can also be, or, or not even their mistakes, the things that I disagree with can also be part of, you know, my communication process. So it is a, a continual, never-ending cycle of learning and feedback and, and self self-development it's essentially as a ceo as an entrepreneur and this is what's very different from being an employee for example so you said something very interesting um before that uh you said it's not only important to stand out on a professional level so meaning what kind of offers you're offering how do your services look like how do you kind of fill the gap in the market but i think something that many people miss to also realize is how they can stand out as a person because we all are different our personalities are quite different and this is again an advantage if you look at it as an advantage right if and most of the time the thing that you want to hide the most is oftentimes the one thing that will actually provide real business growth and will like explode your business because This is oftentimes something that is already missing in the market because everyone else is also hiding it. But if you are brave enough to actually um, show what you are most vulnerable about, right, or that you would like to hide. And that kind of reminds me on, uh, maybe you know her, Rachel Peterson. Yes. <laughs> and her book that she uh, recently launched. I think this is uh, this is a great example of something that normally when we have kids, right, after pregnancy, we would like to hide our stomach uh, like in the last corner, right, never showing yeah. it. But she was actually <laughs> brave to show it and to actually bring more awareness to yeah. an actual reality that we all moms go through, right, uh, specifically the first month after pregnancy. Like we all feel that, we all see that. And she had the bravery to actually do it and look what, what happened after that right she released her book even with the cover that many people uh even criticized right which i absolutely don't understand but um this is something that and i see it always from a lens of a personal brand this is what makes an outstanding exceptional personal brand when you actually combine it with bravery however you can find a place within yourself where you can be brave about the thing that you want to hide the most is actually what ma will make you stand out the most and i would really encourage people to not only look at the business side of it so how your services look and how you can uh, provide any kind of information that other people may be missing like in the era of ai gaps will be filled pretty quickly and you cannot be selling yeah. information alone this is not what will make you successful unless right. it is combined with your humanness with your personality who you are as a human what do you stand for and what do you fight against so to speak if we speak in movie terms you know yeah <laughs> this is what will break help you break through it you know break the ceiling yeah. of of your you feeling stuck in all of this and it, it will actually not take as much time as you think right many people also get stuck on a concept that building a business has to take years it will take years if you intend to uh may build it in years right but actually yeah. the, the movement the growth can be extremely quick if you understand a few key concepts that 
I find so amazing that you touch on them because I do, I am also fired up about the same things, uh, which <laughs> makes this conversation so easy for me. And you also talk <laughs> about value, right? What it me actually means to bring value to the market, especially when it comes to getting high ticket clients and not just uh, low ticket, uh, likes, comments, and maybe a few yeah. shares. <laughs> I would love to know uh, your take on this. I, I have a love-hate relationship with the word value because, mm -hmm. you know, value is a perception base. And so there are two sides to that coin. There is the value perceived by your client, you know, in, in what you deliver to them. There's the value perceived by your audience, the mass of people who judge you for whatever value you put out there. They're the value, the value that you know that you provide within, within your business. So there are, there are multiple levels to, to value. I think most people only talk about kind of my value content where I give tips and tricks and things. And I think what I first want to say is it goes so far beyond that. So number one, I, I'll say it again. I've probably said it 700 times and anyone's ever heard me speak is going to be like, oh my gosh, likes and comments are never directly correlated to your income. Um, and I have a beautiful client with me in, in my group coaching container. And I said this to her when she joined in, just to give you a good example. She put up a post. It was a value post. <laughs> and she was talking about, you know, controversial stuff. Um, just for confidentiality reasons, I'm not going to say anything too detailed about it. Fact was, this post went up and she got no likes. And she came to me and she said, Lauren, I'm going to take the post down. I said, do not take the post down. Why on earth would you take the post down? No, it tanked, she said. I said, how do you know it tanked? And she's like, well, I got no likes. I said, it doesn't matter. Leave it there. Post your next post and ignore it. Less than a week later, she signed two clients from that post. Right? So people are lurking. People are watching. That means when you are judging value as the person putting out the content, of course, you want to understand the demographics, the psychographics, the, the challenges, the problems, the, the persona that you are talking to. Of course you do. You want to be talking to your one ideal client. But at the end of the day, that value perception is built out of many, many different elements that you don't see, right? Because it's a perception on something else. So likes and comments, not directly correlated to, L, uh, to income. That means for me, value is very simple. It means putting your content, your expertise out there with intention. And for me, that's the intention to serve. So that means in a way that is aligned with your values, with your beliefs, um, with your business purpose. Because when you do this, you won't appeal to the masses necessarily. And you might not get lots of likes and loves and hugs and hearts and kisses and comments, right? Mm -hmm. But you will attract those clients that are right for you because they're resonating with not just what's in the post, but the way in which it's written, the way in which you show up. The last 10 posts that you've written, the last 10 times you've shown up on a reel, on a live or whatever it is, they're creating a holistic picture of yourself. And that is the, you know, um, the value that's correlated when you show up all the time. So that, that's what it's about for me. It's about that intention to serve. The value comes from representing your beliefs, your perspective, your business purpose, being clear on it, right? Um, and attracting those clients that are right for you. And you mentioned the word high ticket clients as well. And I know that this is a, is a big uh, topic as well. You know, you have to go high, high ticket and all these kinds of things. I've actually stopped in my own business and I am a high ticket coach as well. I mean, I have high ticket one on one containers. I have a group program, etc. So I guess by that definition, everyone has their own definition. But anything over five, six, seven thousand dollars, high ticket. Um, I prefer to talk about premium clients because I found when I was working in the high ticket space, well, I am working in the high ticket space, but when I was defining it that way, the conversations that I was having with people were I'm lo only looking for someone who's high ticket, meaning they have money in the bank to pay me. I do not believe that that makes the best client. I've had clients who've paid me 10K for three months and I've fired them. Why? Because they don't respect my boundaries. It has not been a healthy relationship. All the things that I value in my business. So I prefer really to talk about premium clients because a premium client is someone who is willing to make the investment. It's not my problem if they've got in the bank or how they get. I don't push people to make investments with me. They make the decision because they're premium. They have done their research. We've had a conversation. We, they think it's a fit. They're all adults. They can manage their time. They can manage their money and their finances. It's not about that. They're premium because they are willing to invest both their money and their commitment to their business because they're values led and they're driven by the desire to make a real impact. So that for me in my business, not everyone will define that for themselves and should define that for themselves. So I'm giving obviously a personal example because this is something that's individual to your business. And I encourage everyone listening to not just take the standardized definitions of high ticket, premium, ideal. Take the time to sit down and define it for yourself. 
because that's going to change the way that you start to communicate with people who you want to actually work with. I love that. And I would love to go to what you mentioned about your client when she posted that post and she had zero comments on it. This is also an observation that I've made in my personal business and also in the business of other clients. I think there is a concept that coaches or beginner coaches especially need to understand in order to analyze what's going on in their businesses properly and i think that goes back to cold warm and hot audience and my belief and my observation is that a cold audience is generally someone that doesn't know you at all which is why they will more likely tend to like your stuff right a warm audience is someone yeah they know you they know how you look they might feel what you're all about they didn't uh, invest the time to research anything about you but they have seen a couple of things about you, so they are more likely to comment. So they are a level above the cold audience that will be somewhat restricted in interacting with you because they don't know you, they don't quite trust you, but they are willing to press on on that like, you know. And exactly. a hot audience, um, in my understanding, is someone who has a different set of action um, and especially when we talk about premium clients, those especially, they will save their energy, not like, not comment, exactly. but they will go ahead on your website and they will purchase because they are convinced that you are the right person for them. Exactly. That's exactly the point. And, you know, at the end of the day, at any given time, there are only about 3% of people in your audience who are ready to buy right now. It doesn't mean you can't move people from cold to warm to hot. Of course, we're doing that. But that does take a lot longer. That takes time. So you're talking to those people, the ideal person that you want, who's going to be sitting in that 3%, right? Those are the people you're going to be talking to. It doesn't mean you're ignoring 97%. Of course you aren't. But they, they are perceiving you in a different way. But the more you can focus your perception to attract in those you know, premium clients, the easier everything else is going to be for you. At least that's certainly what I see in my business and definitely what I see in the business of, of my clients as well when we focus on that you know, from that perspective. Um, not only that, I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> someone who's going to probably invest three and a half or 10K is, is five or six or however much money probably doesn't care about the motivational quote you put out, right? Those likes are coming because we do want to spin the algorithm. And there, I'm going to be very transparent as well. We all need to be putting out the engagement type content because that is the system in which we're working if we're working with organic social media marketing. We do need the engagement. We do want the likes, but not on every single post. And so I know and see that with every profile. And, you know, you've, you've had a lot of experience in this as well, Ella. One post which will make us money will have nowhere near the amounts of likes, comments, engagement as the posts that are boosting our profiles. We also have to be very realistic and detach it from our personal value. Somehow the likes and comments we're attaching to our personal perception of our value, which has nothing to do with it. I'm boosting my algorithm when I put out a motivational quote. I am, I'm wanting to inspire people as well. Of course I am. You know, inspiration is part of um, being a coach, motivating people, getting them to believe in themselves. Of course it is. But do I expect to make a sale from that post? Absolutely not, because that is not the function and the purpose of that in my business, in my strategy at that particular point in time. And so I think that's also a very, very, very important point. And I think that all depends on the strategy that someone would want to go for. You can absolutely gain clients um, by only focusing on your cold audience that you slowly warm up until they are ready to buy. It takes the longest, right? Or you can focus with your strategy on warm audience. Like there are millions of strategies. And I do have the observation that a lot of people feel extremely overwhelmed. Um, by the information, by the different strategies, by the tactics, not knowing the difference between strategy and tactics and not knowing who they are themselves, right? How to actually stand out in the market that we've just talked about, right? And I think there needs to be more work done on clarifying what is what and offering people more of an overarching look at the business um, landscape in general like this is my feeling that and, and this was the same feeling when i started with the business online i threw myself into this ocean with all of the sharks in it you know and <laughs> i felt so lost uh, like i got bitten so many times like everyone can relate right we, we all have been there in this uh, dangerous ocean so to speak um and only slowly we kind of 
get the clarity with time, with a lot of effort, with a lot of studying through it. Even if we have a coach, it still takes time to go through all of this. Of course. And I personally feel very motivated to get uh, this type of clarity to people out there, to have like a general holistic, just like you overview of what is actually possible, right? What makes you unique? How can you stand out in a business setting and also as a person, as a personal brand? How can you manage that? Um, but also, how can you structure your business in, in a strategic way that makes sense for you? Because you don't want to burn out. It, it's, it doesn't make sense to have exactly. 10 million in your bank account, but you are lying in the bed, you're broken and burned out. Like, there especially for us women, if we have kids and most of my clients and most of the audience of this podcast are moms. So we have to, I feel that this is my personal responsibility somehow to provide them exquisite information so that they can make better choices when it comes to business. Okay. And when we talk about red ocean, blue ocean, I know that you have a personal take on this as well. Let's make an example so people who are listening to this can actually um, fathom it in, in, in a more clear way. What is an example for a red ocean let's let's make it for a health coach let's say i'm a health coach i'm just starting out and i want to position myself not being killed by all the sharks around me but how can i position myself and actually surround myself or put myself into a blue ocean like let's define those two in case someone doesn't know what is red ocean what's blue ocean <laughs> and for the example of a health coach because i know a lot of health coaches are listening to this podcast <laughs> with pleasure. I mean, this, let, let's first start with the definition, I think. When we talk about a blue ocean, blue ocean strategy is a concept that has been developed to describe a marketplace in which we are, as in a blue ocean, we're swimming alone. You know, picture yourself on a beach somewhere, you've got clear waters in front of you, nothing is disturbing the water. That means I can go in there and I can enjoy that water and that market in the way that I wish to. And I can impact that market in the way that I wish to without so many external um, factors driving and pushing and putting pressure on the way in which I show up in that market, in the way in which I create my offers for that market, deliver my services in that market, etc. The opposite of that is obviously a red ocean full of sharks, as you said. So I was going to say, if you haven't been bitten, you haven't played the game. We all swim in red oceans at one point in another, because what I also want to make clear is that these blue oceans they come and they go and and as as water you know the tide comes in and the tide goes out you're never in a perfectly blue ocean or never stuck well you can be stuck in a red ocean but if you're trying to get yourself out even if you're in a perfect blue ocean right now the market's changing all the time so think of water coming in and kind of making your lovely blue ocean a little bit red as some sharks come in and, and nibble some fish on the edge of that right because in the red ocean is where everyone is fighting for the same clients with the same offers this is what i refer to as the market of, of mass mediocrity, particularly nowadays in coaching and consulting, when you see everyone saying the same thing. So let's do AI. Here's my chat GPT prompt. As the lead magnet is fine, but if you put your coaching on, that can be very, very, very challenging. I'm going to come to the health uh, professionals example just now. But we all know these things. We all see it. So if I'm a business coach or I'm a, sorry, if I'm a health coach and I'm coming into the space and I'm thinking, well, I've got my credentials. I'm a dietitian. I'm going to say to people, hi, everyone. I can help you lose weight. Let's hop on. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching to give you a diet plan, to give you accountability and to make sure that you lose, I don't know, on average one kilogram a week. 2.2 pounds i have to translate that for whoever's listening around the world right per week you're in a red ocean because everybody's doing that right um and every health coach almost on the planet can do that and so that is a very very competitive space and unless you are differentiating yourself and finding a competitive advantage in something completely different like let's say you are a miss universe bodybuilder and have you know a special methodology for that you are going to struggle to stand out and, and and to be able to compete in that red ocean and so the whole point of what i do with my clients is to find that blue ocean space for them and that's very difficult to say generically for any health coach now to suddenly come up you know pop up with a blue ocean because that blue ocean is exactly that combination of unlocking your competitive advantage really digging deep 
into understanding your education, your experience, your expertise. So, so your expertise, which is your education plus your experience and the value that you have and the value you can create out of that alongside what we've talked about, your personality, who you are, self-awareness, self-leadership, your empathy, your character. So very often, for example, I start with my clients because they can't even identify their core expertise, their core skills. So if you look at me, I'll just give you an example there. I would say, if someone looked externally and say, oh, she's good at business, that's a key skill. Yeah, sure. Um, maybe I can do accounting. Maybe, you know, I'm, I'm better at this or better at that. Um, I have an education background, right? Um, I have this. Th those are very superficial things. My core expertise, whether I work as a strategist, as a consultant, as a coach, is the fact that I'm an educator. And that core expertise means I'm a good communicator. It means that I can take complex ideas and simplify them and transfer knowledge so that it can be implemented. And most people would not come up with that core expertise. And so with a health professional, that would be the same. Your core expertise is not the fact that you have the skill of a dietitian. Your expertise might be making people feel comfortable, right? Creating safe spaces through the way that you communicate, through the way that you put your diet plans together, that you are conscious that not everyone can be, you know, diligent and strict. I know that in the health space, this is, you know, the rhetoric as well. Oh, you're just lazy. Oh, you're just not self-disciplined enough. Oh, you're not. And being a mom myself and actually currently trying to get rid of the last 10 kilos, um, that sucks, you know? So maybe a blue ocean space for someone can be literally as simple as I'm taking a different approach for moms, you know, it does have a little bit to, to do with niching down, for moms to help them embrace their bodies while they lose the weight so that they can feel good again about themselves, right? Again, it, it's very, I'm, I'm nervous to say that that is a blue ocean because a blue ocean is something that takes a lot of in-depth, detailed work um, with the individual and with the way in which they structure their competitive advantage and their individual business, actually, and their offer suite and everything that they're doing. Um, but I hope that that at least gives the listeners a very good definition of what those two things are and the objective of what they're trying to achieve um, by getting into a blue ocean space. Yes, I think what we can say then is that you should know what your skills are or your core skill that you enjoy so much that you can imagine doing it for the rest of your life and that you ask yourself who would benefit the most from my particular exactly. skills, right? And then right. you can kind of choose also, who would I love to work with? Like not just niching down because you found a, exactly. you downloaded a freebie of someone who <laughs> gave you 200 um, blue ocean niches. niches, you know? <laughs> that's, not, that's not really it because you need to analyze all the freebies that you've downloaded and filter it yeah. through who you are and who you want to become. Right. If you don't do that, you will just randomly try out stuff and see what sticks and never really find that type of fulfillment. That was the only reason why you actually started the business, because you were looking for that type of fulfillment, but you will never find it unless you filter every type of information that you get and you be really rigid and really strict with everything that comes at you yeah. right and there's a lot that will come at you right especially oh, for us yes. women like <laughs> we are receptive to every little detail that swims out in the in the online space so we need to be exactly. extra careful i mean we can listen to everything but actually don't let everything into your life don't try everything that is out there but really be very conscious about what you choose ask yourself what you really want to be as a coach Exactly. as a person and where do you want to take your business correct and, and that will most of the time not be impacted by a simple download right oh, it needs yeah. a lot of more deep work and i know that you are a fan of deep work a fan of uh, doing really diligent work when it comes to strategy when it comes to really making up your mind really um structuring your business in a way that it has longevity right you are not exactly. the type of coach that would give any kind of gimmicks to someone just to make a quick buck and i feel that every time when i listen to you every time i go through your content and this is a pleasure to actually uh talk to you because we are on the same same length and it's 
Um, sometimes mm. it feels very lonely when you when you notice uh, a lot of other people not doing it this way, just selling stuff that they believe will make a quick buck. It will. You can become a millionaire by selling stuff. But of course. I feel there is no quality to it. There is no fulfillment in selling stuff. Like in the end, and this is one of the reasons why I feel people feel burned out after years of doing business because they're just selling stuff. Like even if you are a coach, but you're still a human being. So if Absolutely. you kind of want to <laughs> yeah. find fulfillment, you need to serve yourself as a human being. You need to strive for that fulfillment, not just filling up your bank account. I hear that a lot, like, oh, I just want to lay on a beach and just relax and my business runs by, by itself and I just invest one mm -hmm. hour a day, AI do, does all the job for me, right? You, like, you live from connection, right? Mm -hmm. There can be too much connection with other human beings, with other clients, the wrong clients, right? If you're targeting the wrong things, mm -hmm. uh, like, but the human connection, I feel, is so crucially important and i think you you are someone that would agree to that right we need to kind of find the personal fulfillment in our work um as the number one goal if you will because yeah. that's the only place from which we can actually inspire someone to do the same which is the only place from which we can actually foster transformation for someone, which we always claim. And I hear that so much. I'm a transformative coach and I can transform your life and I can change your life. Yeah. But how much do you actually transform your own life in that instance? For, for me, it's really, I don't, I don't judge anyone who wants to lie on a beach and earn passive income. I mean, hell, that's also a great idea. I build into my own business passive income streams because I never, as a business owner, as a smart entrepreneur, want to be reliant on only one-on-one -on -one coaching things that are reliant on me in my business so i'll give you an example i'm a mom as well just like many of the people listening my little boy who's three right now was born during COVID and got an infection just after he was born and since then we've had a number of hospital stints with lung problems breathing issues and i'm very grateful for the fact that i have a business strategy and structure in place that allows me to step back sometimes as long as i can serve my clients if i'm not you know constantly online that's a good thing and and so i think it's all about balance and i think it's about your priorities now i think we're talking to coaches and consultants right so i think for coaches and consultants if you are in this space and you are not focused on making an impact and you are not that's adorable <laughs> and you are not um if you're not focused on making an impact and you're not looking for that human connection, then I would just really prefer if you were honest about it and transparent and decided to not call yourself a coach or a consultant. Th th that's just my yes, opinion indeed. on it, but I don't judge anyone. <laughs> Hi. I'm really sorry. I will have to let it's you know. Okay. You know, this, this is an interview, got You know, this is an interview. Aww. Is it serious? Yeah. I yeah, hello. Okay. She wants to be a coach and wants to do all these Fantastic. Zoom calls as well. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. So when we talk about personal goals that uh, coaches might have, and this is also something that a lot of people are struggling with, right? You are so passionate about in the beginning of starting your own business and you're so proud of it. and you want to you want to scream it out into the world hey um, just established a business celebrate with me and become my client i need uh let's go you know but then you kind of realize especially if you are a mom hey you still have the responsibility to be for, uh, there for your kids you have to organize your private life in order for your business life to actually function you have to think about so many different th uh, strategic things and i would love to know how do you help your clients to Kind of align their personal goals that they have for you, their own lifestyles with a business strategy that kind of ensures that growth and profitability without burnout happens and without neglecting their kids and maybe compromising even on that same lifestyle that they have put out on all the um dream boards or however you want to call it right yeah. or the um vision boards <laughs> visual boards yes yeah. uh, how can how can you make that happen for your clients um that's a great question because this is really honestly the center of what i do um i'm a believer there is a business strategy for everyone there is no cookie cutter there is i do not sell one strategy i sell a way 
to think about business. And I always use the quote, if you learn the logic of business, you'll never be broke. So I work with my clients when I teach, I have frameworks to make it simple for them, to structure everything for them so that they can learn and grow. And as they come, become comfortable um, with everything, they can explore you know, what they need. So that's the first thing is that you have to learn this holistic ecosystem of business so that you are empowered to make the strategic decisions that are going to align with your life. Because if I, you know, I've got my business, I'm a mom, um, I have two small kids. So the way in which I run my business, I'm still a professor at a university. I, I like the amount of money I earn, but time is my priority. Now, if I say to someone who's a client who's maybe 25, doesn't really want to go to university or dropped out of university and said, look, I want to do my own thing. My business model is not going to work for them because they're going to be like, why do you only work three or four hours a day in your business? That's stupid. And they're going to say to me, well, I don't only want to work, earn, you know, a couple hundred K from, from my coaching business. I want to earn a million. And so it's all about being very honest with the client in the coaching relationship and saying, what is it that you value in terms of your time freedom, your financial freedom, your location freedom? What do you value in terms of, you know, your family? How much time do you need? How much time do you have to dedicate? Um, what are you envisioning for this in terms of your income? I ask many clients or, or prospects actually before they become clients, how much do you actually want to earn? And the majority of people can't answer that question. Yeah. So it's about getting really, you know, we start by saying, well, what are these personal goals? Many people don't have them other than I want a business that earns me 100K a year. Well, yeah, I know everyone thinks 100K sounds like a lot of money, but to be very honest, after you've paid your taxes, especially if you're living in Germany, um, it doesn't end up that much. So for me, so very this whole, true. This whole hype around $100,000 a year, um, guys, this is just the indicator that you have a business that is now functional, that you have systems and strategies in place, and that you have an offer that's selling. And then really, you know, the fun starts. But to come back to how do you not burn out? It's about saying, what model do I want to pursue? Do I want to send 100,000 cold DMs every day? That's a quantity approach again. Well, if I'm 20 years old and I've got the whole day and night to spend online, yeah, why not? Because it works. It does work. Of course it works. There are a million strategies. The answer is all strategies work. The question is, will it work for you? And so when I see a coach or a consultant only selling one way to do things, and particularly business coaches right now, this is the strategy that will save you. You have to do it this way. I think, well, the only people who are going to have success in that program are people who are exactly like that coach. So then you better be sure that your coach, if you're a mom, is a mom. That your coach, you know, if you only want to work three hours a day, is only working three hours a day. So you have to align all of those things. So that's the first thing. The second thing is your business is supposed to be built within the context of your life. Your business should not run your life because that is the yeah. highway to burnout. That's the highway to not having enough time with your family and your friends and even just for your hobbies to live a life and to have some kind of balance, right? So if we look at it like that, we need to make sure that we understand the context of our lifestyle as it is right now and create a business strategy in alignment with the goals that we want to have because this is an evolutionary process. So we literally map out a growth path for six months, for one year, for two years. And then we say, okay, what is the next logical step? So if we lead from the future. I do want to know where you want to be in your ideal state as a client. And then we reverse engineer that and say, okay, if we want to earn 250K this year, what do we need to earn each month? What do we need to earn each week? Is it realistic on three hours a day to do that? Probably. But if you've put that benchmark at a million, unless you've already got a very good stock of assets that you can earn passive income from, I would probably say, maybe let's look at a two year or a three year span, right? And so it's all about taking those factors into consideration. And at the core of it, again, becomes the individual's willingness to be honest with themselves. Because a lot of people will tell me as well, I want a multi six figure business. Okay but I'm an honest business coach. <laughs> I don't do fluff and I don't, I don't molly coddle my clients either. So you're going to have to put in the work to earn multiple six figures. And that is a lot of work, right? I work a lot. I'm balanced in my work and I'm very careful in my structure, but I also have a huge amount of business experience and skills backing my ability up to do that. And that's what I want to teach my clients. I want my clients to be able to do that because I know that as my kids grow, you know, if I'm not teaching at the university any longer, in the foreseeable future, well, then I've got a whole different ball game and my strategy has to change as well. So when you learn one strategy and you think that this is a strategy that's going to carry you, you know, for a sustainable business, 
strategy is about how we think about our business. You know, a little bit earlier on, you said a lot of people don't understand the difference between strategy, operations, and tactics. So this is probably a really good um, point to, to just explain that because strategy, your business, overall business strategy is how you think about your business and the model that you create to get you to where you want to be at that point, as you've defined it at that point. And that is a moving goalpost because your goals and will grow as your business grows. So that's the strategy for now. You then obviously have your operational strategies. That means, okay, I want to get to 100K in my first year. How am I going to do that? What model am I going to do that with? Am I going to do that with a one-on-one -on -one offer? And I'm going to do that combined with a group coaching offer, for example, as a business coach. Okay, let's, let's see how that works. We do the numbers. And then we move forward with those numbers, right? And then we say to ourselves, okay, in the operational level, I have to have a audience strategy. So if I've got no audience, well, you need to grow an audience before you can sell much. Or maybe I can start with affiliate, right? So you've got different options there. You've got a hundred million strategic options. So you need to create it in a way that says, okay, this is how I'm going to build my audience. This is how I'm going to do my marketing. Am I going to do it organic social media marketing? Or am I going to use paid ads? There's no right or wrong right? There's a strategic relevance or not. It's logical. It's applicable. It's not applicable. It's not about right or wrong, but people are convincing us that only social media, or organic me uh, social media marketing is good or only paid ads are good or whatever it is. And when you say, okay, well, what about my lead generation strategy? Am I going to start a community like a Facebook group or something on LinkedIn? Am I going to go live? Am I going to, how am I going to communicate? So what's my communication strategy? What is my sales process? Do I take calls? Do I have a landing page? Do I, you know, all of these things, have strategies behind them and when those are out of alignment with your overall business strategy that's when things start to fall apart because you'll find yourself for example wanting to be omnipresent on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn and every other platform that's popping up Clapper and Twitter is now X and who knows where right we want to be omnipresent we help we hear all of this but you want to be a high ticket coach and you only want to make 100k like that makes no sense because you're going to strategically in your marketing and communication strategy going to be spending far too much time producing and repurposing content that probably not going to have little value to you because you're not going for a mass market you're going for a targeted higher ticket premium client right so th these are examples of how we take those personal goals at the center the context of the lifestyle and create strategy that aligns from the overall business model and that strategy the way we think about our business with each and every individual operational strategy and then the tactics are the things we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, okay, my tactic was to go live at 3 p.m. on a Wednesday. Ah, oh, that's not working. Let me try Thursday. These are tactics. The so things you just change and adapt and track very, very quickly. I sent out this email. No one opened it. Click rate was down. Okay, let me do that in another way. Those are the tactics, right? But the email marketing is the strategy for the communication, if that makes sense. So I hope that helps the listeners as well, because I think you're right. And I, I think a lot of people do not uh, know the difference on that as well. So let's imagine um, a coach that just decided to get into the coaching space. And since you have so much experience, um, let's um, distill all your knowledge and wisdom into three tips that you would give a beginner coach. I know it's a lot, but take your time. <laughs> that uh, three tips that you would give a beginner coach specifically that would have the most value that you can think of. That yeah, that, that's a great question, actually, um, and, and quite difficult to answer. So I appreciate a challenge. I appreciate a challenge because there's so much when you're new, and I know that this is what overwhelms so many people. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to say is, you know, many people underestimate what it means to be a coach or consultant. So do practice self-reflection. First and foremost, ask yourself, is this something that really brings me joy? Do I want to be responsible and involved in people's lives? Because coaches and consultants, particularly those who want to lead change and create impact, they feel it and they know it. Um, and if you don't have that feeling, question yourself a little bit more, dig a little bit deeper. That's probably number one. Um, number two would be do your research, right? Because I know a lot of people have expertise and a lot of people also have passion and a lot of people have really great experience. But passion, if it's not adequately translated into business purpose with a market fit, it's just going to become an expensive hobby. I know it sounds very harsh, but that is the reality of the space. So it comes back again to the competitive advantage, to knowing your market, to understanding what competition means. Yes, you're in competition. And if you want a business that's going to make money, you have to 
turn that passion, turn that expertise into a unique offer, into a business structure and give it a purpose that you can communicate so that you can justify earning money through that, quite frankly. So do your research, know your market, probably number two. Um, calculate your startup costs, please. And be realistic with your time investment. You know, I see this a lot. The financial side of things is where I ha end up helping a lot of clients. You know, of course, we do the competitive advantage and the uniqueness, but in the operations, in the management of their business, I have a profit pyramid and it works through the stages that every single business needs. Doesn't matter what business you're in, you need purpose, you need positioning, you need to find your people, you need to generate leads, you need to make sales, you need to have your program, deliver your services, but you need to also manage your profit. So you have to understand what am I, you know, people coming to me and they're earning a lot of money sometimes, but they don't know their cash flow. Their profit margins are meager because they've hired teams and, you know, people are duplicating things or they've got tech stacks that are massive. And, you know, they've got all these different platforms and half are doing the same thing. So there's a lack of efficiency there. So make sure you educate yourself on what you need to start this kind of a business. Now you can, and this is the great part, start this business in a very lean way. So you don't need a lot of money. But I would say if you're looking to, you know, replace a salary of five to $10,000 um, a month, you need to make sure that you've got about $1,000 a month to be spending in your business, right? On softwares, on someone to support you, whatever that looks like, right? That, that's an average. It's a very, very ballpark figure, but it's an average. When I look at my clients um, in the startup phase, when I go back to my own financial documents, I needed between $700 and, and $1,000 every single month to get this business going, right? Deve while I'm developing the offers, I can't take that many clients, all these kinds of things. So calculate your startup costs and be realistic with your time investment. And then for those three, if you don't know where to start, you know where to go, get support, whether that's joining a community, asking questions, floating around online in forums. And you know what, if you can, hire a great business coach if you don't have the business acumen, because that is the literally the fast track to get you where you wanna go. Um, so distilling all of that into, into basic advice, I think that would, that would be it for someone who's really starting out. And I would love to emphasize the research here because um, I remember not only myself, but a lot of my clients uh, tend to skip on that part because it's uncool. It's like, and it's oh boring. my God, that's the boring part. I don't get likes from it. I don't like, I don't get comments from it. Like the social media game is sometimes really fun if you're successful in it, right? If you can have yeah. some traction and if you can entertain people and that's really a fun part. But research, especially if you are more on the intuitive side, like you are really feminine, right? You you are um, quite the emotional person, right? You would um, oftentimes run away from everything that has to do with your brain, with thinking, logic, analytics, and all that stuff, research. So I would urge you, even if you are that type of woman, take the time because it will catapult your business in unimaginable heights that you cannot even imagine now from the position that you're in right now the research as boring as it sounds and you need to know how to do proper research right once again i would re-emphasize the uh, the help that you mentioned get help on how to do that type of research. You, you are not alone in this. Millions of people are looking for the same information. So Facebook groups are out there everywhere. Get in contact with Lauren. She will probably be able to help you with doing proper research on that, right? And also when it comes to something that is very, um, uh, taking up the minds of all the people nowadays is uh, technology, right? How you can wrap yeah. around your head around technology that is <laughs> kind of like a distraction. Sometimes it can feel like a distraction, yeah. especially for beginners, I feel, that they might want to skip on research, might want to skip on everything that has to do with um, solid, proven strategy, right? When it comes yeah. to business, right? longevity of a business. They tend to right. jump on the ship of AI, and you mentioned ChatGPT before. And I would really love to know your take on what you think about AI tools, uh, ChatGPT, AutoGPT, and whatever name they have. You know, <laughs> let all me all hear it AI, all. All the all the all the the, the GPTs out there. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I love them. I love them. I'm going to be transparent about that because I think it's fascinating. Uh, of course, with any new technology. There are massive opportunities. There are challenges. There's a dark side to all of this as well, obviously. I use them in my business a lot. 
The key word here, though, is that they are a tool. And now I'm going to be very blunt, Ella, once again, and I'm going to give the formula for people who think, you know, un unfortunately, it's, it's a very simple formula that you have to understand when you, when you use something like AI is shit in, shit out. And so... <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Apologies, but it, it really is like that. So AI will never replace you if you are excellent, if you're an expert. My expert contribution to my business, my knowledge, my experience, my empathy, my content. If I, I don't get AI to write my content, I sometimes put my content into AI to say, do you have a slightly better way to say this? Why? Because I'm an academic. We are known for horrible writing that nobody can understand. And this is social media. So I need to suddenly be a copywriter. And my copywriting skills have really improved since I started my business. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I'm not a trained copywriter. So why not leverage? Because you know, leverage that tool because at the end of the day, I can pick and choose what I use from ChatGPT. So the copy paste, throw it in there like it was, you know, for newbies, people I think unfortunately really do believe they can throw something in there and just copy paste it out there. Uh, good luck. I mean, test it, try it, prove me wrong. I'm always happy to be proven wrong. I, I love developing my perspective on things, but it's a tool. Um, and so <clears throat> it's never going to replace my content. It's certainly not going to replace the way I show up. It's never going to, <clears throat> excuse me, it's never going to, change the way I serve my clients um, and in fact with the rise of AI and, and things like ChatGPT, the, the desire for real human connection is and will continue to to grow for sure so it is a tool it should be considered and used as a tool just like any other tool we have in our business you know it was the same as when email came into the corporate environment it was like wow my gosh this is crazy you know should we be using it but let's pick up a telephone and you know <laughs> we've gone through all of these transitions i remember all the colleagues of mine saying i can't believe the younger generation just sends emails they can never pick up a telephone you know like sure okay i mean i i don't know about you i don't use the phone at all anymore <laughs> so, <laughs> and if i do it's it's a it's a it's a voice note or voxer or whatever that is right so this is the progress and this is the evolution of our industry. And it is as good as the input that you give it. So mediocre, anything that's mediocre will never achieve excellent results just because of the application of AI. Um, and in actual fact, an, an interesting fun fact, I'm working with uh, another Ivy League sort of MBA professor, award-winning professor in AI and innovation. And we are right now creating for an October launch an AI um, in coaching innovation program. And this will be with certification. This is not about creating your content with AI. This is about looking at the levels of our business and saying, how does AI help us as coaches and consultants, predominantly we're focusing on coaches, lead the change that we want to see in the industry, bringing the technology and the human components together to improve, not just save us time and money in our business, but to actually improve the client experience, to coach perhaps using AI. And so I'm going to say again, go back to the, the first sentence. I love it and I'm in there and, and I'm using it and I'm excited about the opportunities, to be honest with you. I was really hoping that someone would start developing this type of tool. Honestly, um, for the past um, probably six months or so, I've obviously been also playing around with AI and ChatGPT and training my personal ChatGPT to uh, deliver whatever needs I have for my business to uh, expand and speed up things uh, because I don't have endless time and there are also more important things that I want to dedicate my time to which is one-on-one uh, -on -one clients for example I don't want to hang out on social media all day even though I enjoy it very much and it's a lot of fun but what I noticed yeah. is that AI is really a tool with which people mistake to achieve virality. And I know you have a very distinct uh, take on virality as well. And I think we are on the same boat here again, that you say virality is kind of a distraction once again, if, uh, if a person really solely focuses on, oh, I wanna go viral. Like you can use AI to go viral. It's possible. I've okay. seen so many examples, amazing examples of people who have just been playing around and getting 100K in 30 days on Instagram. That's all possible. But the caveat to virality is always that speed determines connection the level of connection so whenever something goes too fast and we know that from relationships right if i meet you in a bar and i tell you hey want to marry like, like you'll run. 
you will run. So <laughs> connection actually takes time. So whenever you are just seeking out virality, you are trying to shorten the speed with which you want to achieve something very particular in your business. And you also mistake virality with um, monetary success. Just because you have 100K views or even followers doesn't mean that you will actually have a bank account that will back it up, right? On the contrary, oftentimes, like people who have the most viral videos oftentimes are the poorest people oh, on this on social media landscape. So let me hear your take on virality. <laughs> well, again, we're going to come full circle to intention because virality happens in two ways. Um, sometimes completely, like luckily, unintentionally, right? And so something goes viral. I've been posting content, I'm working online, and for whatever reason, some video that I make goes viral. Great, that brings a lot into my business. Why? Because I simply get a lot more eyeballs on what I'm already doing. People come into my community, but everything, the foundations of my business are in place. So when people come in in a sudden flood due to a mistaken you're not mistaken but not fully not targeted for the virality from that viral video then yes of course i get a sudden influx in my business is that awesome yes of course but it's like a tidal wave so it's going to come it's going to hit make sure you can manage it amazing cash injection to your business if you have the foundations in place if you are targeting virality and you don't have anything of real value to sell and you're not positioned and you don't have a personal brand and you don't really have a business or you don't know anything about business you haven't laid those foundations you go viral and so what a lot of people are looking at you are they going to take out their wallet and pay you to do something for them probably not because like let's be honest like a lot of people are going viral and you're viral today and someone else is viral tomorrow so it's, it's like the epitome of not sustainable right and so that's how i see it it always comes back to intention if my intention is to just go viral well I would rather, especially as a coach or consultant, I would rather place my energies into building my business, creating amazing offers that then start to speak for themselves because I don't want to chase clients. I love it when people come into my inbox and say, hey, Lauren, I saw your masterclass. I really want to work with you. That's what I want to get for all my clients as well. Of course, we do some prospecting. You're always going to have some kind of outbound, particularly when you're starting out. That's normal because you want to get people into your ecosystem. But if you can build a connection and a relationship and serve them, to the highest value, with the highest quality, with intention, with empathy, with your expertise, bringing your experience to them, and your client is happy, those referrals, the happy client, the client stays with you. Those are the things that are going to give you sustainable, long-term financial success in your business and reputational success, because it's also about reputation, right? Because the two most important numbers in our business are your client acquisition cost. So virality can help. You can get lots of clients pretty cheaply, maybe, yeah, sure, organically. But if that's your intention, I have the opinion that it's highly unlikely that the second one, which is your lifetime value of your customer, the customers that stay with you, you know, we're taught that it's, it's a, it's a, it's a pipeline, like, you know, audience, prospects, clients, and they go, they fall like they drop out the bottom of the funnel. You know, that's what we're taught. It's actually cyclical. I totally talk about full circle client acquisition because you want to be focused on repeat business, on referrals, building those systems again, because that is what gives you the foundation for a sustainable business and those two numbers are very very important so virality doesn't really help that it can but if that's your focus and and your intention the chances of it feeding into a structured system are, are, are very low because your priorities are different i don't need particularly need a big audience and most people don't to monetize to a significant level that is very true. And virality also oftentimes only serves to towards engagement, but not, not conversion, right? So, Correct. and I, I'm, um, maybe I'm a bit weird when it comes to that, but I believe numbers are a huge distraction in the Western world. Absolutely. Um, I've lived for the longest time as a kid without numbers. Uh, of course, I went to school and all that stuff, but uh, the, a very prevalent time for me was actually to be in nature and be very in, in my body. And when I came to Germany as a kid, I realized how much people rely on numbers, rely on time. So really um, making themselves dependent on a structure that is not innate to their own bodies and to the actual right. health system that is built in, right? You don't need to yeah. reinvent the wheel here you have already um, 
rules and and uh, things that govern your health and your body and so mm, by following numbers you will actually not build ultimate trust with uh, yeah. someone and you talked about the loyalty right i would call that loyalty yeah. someone who would come again and again into your business because exactly. they trust you beyond the first purchase they trust you uh, to guide them in different levels of their business not just um, get them a quick win if you will right exactly. so correct i would place numbers actually if i would if i were to build it trust pyramid if you will with different layers what actually are the trust builders especially for coaches yeah. in this instance i would place numbers actually at the lowest level like if you have a lot of followers if you have viral videos if you have even if you have a hundred k or even a million in your bank account this is still at the lowest level of trust building factors that will actually help someone trust you in a way to pay you money to help them become your customer because i think there are much more important trust builders i call them always brand assets because they uh, they are the only things that make you stand out and this is a full circle to what we've been talking about in the beginning yeah. like and you need to all people are need to be very aware of these different trust builders and not rely so much on the numbers because they are distracting you from what is really important for you to do, especially online on social media. Many yeah. people are hunting the algorithm, which is nothing more than people. Really, I believe in that. It's not a system. Yeah, this is, if it is a system, it's built on human psychology on purpose yeah. because that system wants to pick people's brains and put them into certain behaviors, right? They want to make right. people do certain things stay on youtube binge watch you know or stay yeah. on TikTok and watch for four hours and you look at the clock and think oh my god i need to go to sleep <laughs> you know so back to the numbers i think we need to be very aware of these things yeah. to especially as coaches because they don't mean so much not as much as many people think and they focus so much on it that they miss out on the real brand assets that they could be building, that they could be harnessing the empathy that you mentioned, the communication skills that you mentioned, that are true trust builders with people. You can have zero credentials, but if your communication skills and your empathy is at the level 100, like this then is the ultimate yeah. thing. If you yeah. are a likable person, if you are someone who can listen, actively listen to a person's pain points, that person is more likely to go with you, more likely to be working with you um, than with someone who does not have these particular qualities that we expect a coach to have, but has, let's say, five million in a bank account and they are flattering around with it. You know, I have five million in my bank account, become my client. Exactly. Like, that's not going to convert them. Like conversion oftentimes takes place on an emotional level and not on a logical level and numbers are logical. Correct. Correct. I think if you're advertising with your Stripe bank account, well, for, for me, for example, that that's just attracting the wrong kind of client. Um, and for all the reasons that you've just mentioned, actually. So that that's just a practical example of how I would view that. Now, do I encourage my clients and do I show them how to track their numbers so they understand their cash flow and this in their business? Absolutely. But in the same respect, do we care about engagements and likes unless we're trying to get visibility up? No, not really. So it's all again about what is the intention? What is the purpose? What correlation to the outcome that I'm trying to achieve does that number have? But yes, our entire lives, this is how we're raised, has been put into to boxes of numbers. You know, we, we have to wake up at this time. We have to start school at 8 a.m. or work at 8 a.m. We work 9 to 5. These are all constructs that um you know that we're indoctrinated into and that's the same on social media as it is offline in, in a corporate job or whatever that might be and so i think the best thing that we can do for all of ourselves and our businesses if we want to really grow something that's meaningful to us and impactful to the people around us and to those who that we want to serve is we just need to be aware of those constructs and decide individually for ourselves and i think this is the highest level of empowerment um is showing people that and then saying well now make your decision what is it that you want to do because if you want to then sell low ticket and go viral and do whatever you want, go, go ahead, no judgment there. But we're talking again, coming back to who are we speaking about? We're speaking about coaches and consultants. My, my, my community are coaches and consultants who are building their businesses and who are leading change. 
the intention and the focus is just completely different you know from from someone who wants to go viral because they're sharing canva tips i don't know or something like that right not that that's bad <laughs> wasn't meant as a negative example just that's an example right um and so i think that this is this is what we need to be really really aware of when we're building a business because we do need a balance between the technicalities of the business skills and acumen that is required of you know to build a business like this online and and what we need to be doing on a day how do we post where do we post how do we send emails how do we create funnels what's the logic of that blah 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 but at the center of everything and this is why i go back to the, the competitive advantage framework and the advantage quadrant that i work with the you is always at the center self-leadership which is made up of self-awareness and self-management are always at the center and only then do the four levels come in only then can we speak about your expertise excellence your value excellence your adaptive excellence your collaborative excellence because this is the evolutionary cycle of the four levels that you need to start mastering and evolving with to run a business that is technical but actually foundationally based on on human needs on human behaviors on human psychology on connection on taking the responsibility again of getting into someone's life changing them for the best creating that impact that you want to create um, and so that's what always begins with you and anyone who, who pops onto my social media on particularly on facebook will see you are your advantage so i always say to my clients your expertise is your business but you are your advantage i love that and what is your vision then for your business i'm really sure that you have uh, a big and very firm vision where you want to go very with big. your business. <laughs> Let's hear That's it. A, lovely question. a very big one. Um, look, my business is always evolving. If a business isn't evolving, it's dying. So a lot of yeah. people are like, wow, you're always doing something different. I'm like, I love that. That's what we need to do. So um, my own business should always therefore be evolving and growing, which means I'm going to continue on focusing, expanding my offer portfolio, making the signature advantage framework, um, this advantage quadrant framework available to as many people as possible. Because for me, my company name is actually Elevated Futures. So I want to be the kind of coach that is there that can give access to the highest quality business skills, education and support. So inspiration, implementation and knowledge. And I work with those three eyes, information, implementation and inspiration to anyone who wants to understand and is willing to put the work in to become truly excellent at what they do. It's, it's not about formal credentials, but to become excellent at what they're passionate about, at what they do in their field um, and in business. So in a nutshell, I'm focused on really using my background in education, particularly, as well as this diverse business exp expertise that I have to empower as many people as possible to elevate their own future. That means I'm focused on creating accessible offers of the highest quality um, and making sure that as many people as possible have that individual context specific, um, you know, focused support that they need so that they can get where they need to go as far as possible, essentially. That's it. Where can people find you if they decide to work with you? The easiest is just, you know, pop onto social media. I'm primarily on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, just connect with me. Say hi if you're listening. Like, please drop me a personal message. Like, you know, you can obviously come and like a couple of my posts if you want to. <laughs> but what I'd really appreciate is if you're coming into my world, I always make a point, um, whether it's on Facebook or LinkedIn, where I'm prim primarily I'm hanging out quite a lot is just say hi, drop into my DM, drop me a voice note, say, hey, I heard you on Ella Ray um, and let's start a conversation and yeah, let's get in touch because I think that that's where all the other opportunities, whatever comes out of that will happen the way it's supposed to happen anyway. So everyone is welcome. Please do connect. That's so awesome. Thank you so much, Lauren. This conversation was really beautiful and I didn't even feel that we were talking so long, but I could talk with you like for the next 10, 10 hours. Likewise. Thank you, Ella. It's been a, it's, it's such a, such a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you for the amazing questions. Some of which definitely put me on the spot, but that's always great. Um, so yeah, pleasure to be here. Thank you very, very much again. And yeah, to everyone out there listening, I uh, hope this was, was helpful and informative and that you could take something away from it.